Hi, this is another episode of Think About It. I'm Eric Johnson, a professor of Christian psychology at Houston Christian University, uh, a member of the Gideon Institute of Christian Psychology and Counseling. And I'm very happy to be able to spend some time with my friend, Dr. Joshua Nabb, a professor of psychology at California Baptist University, the founding director of their uh, doctorate in psychology and also an editor of the journal of psychology and Christianity. So welcome, Josh. Thanks so good for having to, me. So good to see you. Yeah. Uh, you have a really interesting history, I think, uh, since you've been in the field. And uh, I think our viewers would like to hear maybe some of your background and what brought you to the place you're at today. Sure, well, first of all, thanks for having me. It's a, always exciting to get to talk to you. And uh, so, yeah, I think earlier on in life, I grew up in a, I would probably describe it as a conservative Christian home. and. In uh, my adolescent years, uh, my, my parents ended up divorcing, and so that was tough for me. And, and so that led me down a path of, I think, what I would describe as a prodigal period of time, kind of wandering away from my Christian faith. But I came back to it in my early to mid-20s, and I went into my own personal psychotherapy, and I found that it was extremely helpful for me. And that led me to really want to commit my life to walking with people as they learn how to really address their suffering mm -hmm. and the impact that psychological suffering I think has on people including Christians and so I went into graduate school I went to a Christian university I ended up going to an internship in my fifth year of the program we have to do a full-time internship as part of the degree requirement and I went to a Christian psychiatric hospital and I found that when I was there at the hospital, they were doing a lot of practices that were basically what's called mindfulness meditation. And I found that for me, mindfulness meditation came out of a, a different faith tradition, out of Buddhism. And so I started asking questions in my training about do Christians have our own practices? And so that led me really down a path of what we might call Christian retrieval and, and trying to better understand psychologically and spiritually what practices coming out of the Christian tradition uh, Christians have to draw from for psychological and spiritual health to address depression and anxiety and trauma, uh, stress, relational problems. And so as I finished my internship and then I did another year there as a postdoctoral fellow, I ended up landing at California Baptist University, a Christian university, and continued that line of research. Mm -hmm. I got licensed as a psychologist, so I practiced psychology in the state of California with a psychology license. And in addition to being a practitioner, I really enjoy doing research on how to draw from confidently the Christian faith tradition to help Christians to pursue psychological change. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty familiar with the field, and you have done some remarkable work uh, in, in doing original research in distinctly Christian uh, approaches to uh, therapy, as well as measuring um, qualities of the Christian life that we believe uh, demonstrate a kind of uh, well-being that's unique to Christianity. Would you tell us about some of that work? Sure, sure. So. Oftentimes in the research that we do, we have to measure things. And so for many of the measurement tools that we have in psychology, they come from the secular community. They're not Christian per se. And so I realized early on if I wanted to research Christianity and psychological functioning within Christianity that I needed to develop some uniquely Christian tools to do that. And so a few of the tools that I've co-developed with some colleagues include uh, a scale measuring communion with God, the idea of fellowshipping with God and walking with God along the roads of life. life. I've also developed a Christian contentment measure or scale that looks at this idea of an inner satisfaction regardless of outer circumstances for Christians that's reliant upon God and reliant upon God's, God's dwelling within. Also a, a gratitude scale that's Christian. So looking at what Christian gratitude looks like, maybe in contrast with what the world says thankfulness or gratitude should look like. And then more recently, I developed a measure for evaluating a Christian worldview. 
that is pretty comprehensive in scope, and I'm hoping that it will help Christians to measure worldview and to look at psychologically a Christian worldview in the context of things like suffering, things like Christian mental health, uh, and so forth. In terms of some of the uh, interventions, if we want to call them that, or ways that Christians can draw from Christian practices that are in historic Christianity, I've done some research looking at Christian meditation, Christian prayer practices, Christian contemplation, turning to classic Christian writings, so writings from the Puritans, writings from the Jesuit Christian tradition, writings from you know, the Eastern Orthodox tradition and, and the Jesus prayer, and looking at those things evangelically mm -hmm. and recognizing that we have a rich heritage of Christian thinkers and practitioners who have really tried to develop practices that can help Christians psychologically and spiritually to be more like Christ and to relate differently to suffering, not necessarily eliminate it, but relate differently to it. Mm -hmm. And many of these prayer practices, meditative practices, contemplative practices, for me are in order to promote what I like to call meditative diversity. What does mm -hmm. that mean? That means that oftentimes in our contemporary society, we turn to mindfulness. Mindfulness is everywhere. So much so that people have jokingly called it mindfulness because it's <laughs> so embedded in pop culture. Mm -hmm. And it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Mm -hmm. But for Christians, we have our own heritage. We have our own practices. And so for Christians who are struggling psychologically, I've wanted to give them uh, options for drawing upon their own heritage to stay within their own proverbial house and not have to go down the street to the neighbor's house uh, to, to be fed. And so these practices we've recognized they are helpful for people, uh, comparable to mindfulness meditation or another newer one is called loving kindness meditation that's really popular in clinical psychology right now for a, a wide variety of types of suffering. And mm. so Christian practices drawn from the Christian tradition can be beneficial when it comes to things like negative thinking and stress and symptoms of depression and anxiety and trauma. Mm. So um, you're, you're, a, you're a psychologist, and I, you know, I, I, I hear you talking so with such relish about the, the Christian practices and, and, and uh, a Christian approach to well-being. But I thought, isn't it the case that, that psychology just deals kind of generally with, with helping people to get better and, and helping people to overcome their symptoms? What's, what's wrong with just being, you know, seeing therapy done by Christians as it's, it's just to help us feel better, get better? Yeah, well, I think a few things. One is, rightly so, I think the discipline of psychology in the 21st century is recognizing that culture is at the center mm -hmm. of these conversations. And so we cannot remove people from their culture. Uh, and that, that one, one author says that, that worldview is the deep structure of culture, meaning where there's culture, there's an underlying worldview, a view of the world. And so I think psychologists in the 21st century are rightly looking more and more to culture and saying culture is important to help people in their suffering. And so as Christians, we have a rich cultural heritage, mm. a spiritual heritage, a religious heritage that can't be ignored when we try to make sense of the good life, when we try to make sense of human flourishing and well-being and some of these things about what makes life optimal and also what to do about suffering. Mm. And so I think more and more we're recognizing that we can't separate out culture from psychological functioning. They need to be married, uh, tethered together. They need to be uh, fused together because there is no such thing as someone really sort of floating around in space, uh, not tethered to the spaceship, which is really culture. Culture mm. is so relevant. And so I think culture is at the center of these conversations and Christians should not be an exception. We should be able to confidently draw from our own tradition our own worldview, our own heritage, so that we don't have to check those things at the door if we go into therapy or if we buy a book on how to help, help psychologically speaking. It, it's, you, you, you know, what you're saying reminds me, reminds us that it's not like psychology or 
therapy was invented in the late 1800s or the early 20th century, Christians have been very keenly interested in the well-being of people mm -hmm. since Jesus, who came as a healer. And it's quite clear throughout the Christian mm -hmm. tradition, centuries, that people have been working to help one another and, and forming monasteries and pastoral care to, to, uh, to, to work with people suffering. And it sounds like you see that, that uh, all of that work is in some way valuable for this, the science of psychology. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I teach a, a class on the history of psychology, and it's a fascinating history that oftentimes if we're maybe taking an undergraduate psychology class or we're majoring in psychology, and psychology is one of the top majors in the United States for undergraduates, the idea is that psychology has always existed as this formal discipline, if you will, with, with science behind it. The reality is that Christians and others have been thinking psychologically and trying to make sense of the study of the mind and human behavior for millennia. And the psychology used to really be housed in the disciplines of theology and philosophy. Mm -hmm. And so it was only about maybe 150 years ago, mid to late 1800s, where we started trying to separate out psychology into its own quote unquote discipline and set up labs to try to you know, isolate variables and establish the relationship between psychological variables. But uh, the idea that psychology is only a, a modern or contemporary discipline that has not been uh, thought about and practiced by Christians for millennia is just not true. Mm -hmm. In fact, many of our most current theories, uh, or at least some in clinical psychology, are not just something that sort of a, a stork dropped on, on one's front doorstep, <laughs> but have been drawn from ancient philosophy. And uh, for the example of mindfulness comes from Buddhism and mindfulness meditation and, and writings on mindfulness are millennia old. And so I think we need to be humble in recognizing that we are standing on the shoulders of giants and that there are many psychologists for, prior to the formal founding of psychology, no exception in Christianity. Mm. And so we need to be aware that there is not this clear dividing line between you know, pre-modernism and, and uh, a pre-psychology and somehow all of a sudden this formal founding, but that we've been thinking psychologically for a long time. And the difference would just be we've uh, used scientific methods to try to uh, and, and, and with some success, although not as much success maybe as the hard sciences, physics, etc. But we've tried to look at the relationship between psychological variables, if you will, and the mind and behavior with some success, but it's been challenging. But that would probably be the formal founding of psychology where we've set up labs and we've tried to in lab settings, uh, control for things and isolate things. And, but we've been thinking psychologically for millennia. Mm -hmm. And if there's one really great example, it's the mindfulness movement. Mindfulness mm -hmm. comes from Buddhism and, and there's some influence from Hinduism as well. And basically what psychologists did is they made up, not made up, but they developed definitions. They developed ways to measure mindfulness. They wrote down ways through steps to practice mindfulness, and then they researched mindfulness. And there's a whole body of, of research that says it works. Mm -hmm. So why can't we do the same in the Christian tradition? Mm -hmm. Why can't we take our heritage, define things with clarity, develop steps and then mm -hmm. see if they work for Christians mm -hmm. for psychological change. And, and you've documented that it does work and that it's equally effective. I think right. all the research has been done comparing Christian models of therapy with or even accommodated models and mainstream models of therapy have shown that that they're at least as effective That's as right. secular models. That's and right. when working with Christian clients, they seem to be more effective with Christians. That's right. So uh, why do you suppose that Western culture, which is supposed to be a Christian culture, has so gravitated more, more towards Buddhist mindfulness and not been in the practice of, of retrieving uh, Christian uh, meditative practices and prayer. Yeah, and I think that there's a, 
maybe bigger picture challenge there in that we still have, I think the, the latest data suggests that two thirds of adults in the United States still identify on some level as Christian, and yet far fewer psychologists identify as Christian. Mm -hmm. And so I think some of it is related to motivation on what they think this life is about. And, and so many psychologists are what we might call secular and, and don't really see religion and spirituality as foundational to psychological health. And so there's maybe been a neglect of the role that religion and spirituality play in psychological functioning. Mm -hmm. I think also looking at the history of the mindfulness movement, really coming out of gaining momentum in the 60s and 70s, it seems as though you have a lot of psychologists who turn to Eastern practices maybe in their own life and then went to graduate school and got a, a PhD in psychology and learned ways to research things and then began to apply some of the things that they were learning in their own life to the practice of clinical psychology. And so I think because many psychologists don't identify as Christian, uh, or religious per se, that they might not see it as, as relevant, even though the majority of maybe the public that they serve does. And then I think personally, they identified maybe more with, many of them identified more with Eastern practices that they were using in their own life and, mm. and saw the benefit for them. And so it then took that and, and used research to try to support that more mm. broadly. And so I think that's probably what I'm doing too. Mm. And so if they could do yeah. it, I could do it. Yeah. And so I, it's interesting because this movement, this mindfulness movement might sound odd, but it's given me more confidence than maybe I could have ever had in seeing a recipe for how to do that. And then re really taking it and applying it mm. to the Christian faith and to say, uh, you know, I've, I've, in my early twenties, I was fascinated by cr these Christian practices and and a deeper intimacy with God. And I wasn't satisfied with just an overly abstract, uh, you know, reading of scripture, but I wanted to deeply engage with scripture and, and practice God's presence. And, and so mm. getting excited in my own life, like these psychologists did with mindfulness and, and then wanting to mm. then maybe help other people to get excited too, mm. and to see the psychological benefits. And so I think I've been emboldened by the mindfulness movement to say, if they can do it successfully, that I could do it successfully. Mm. But I think returning to your question, I think there's probably a gap and uh, there's a, there are a lot of reasons for it, but uh, there's a gap between maybe psychology as a secular discipline and then maybe the populations that psychologists serve who mm. tend to be more religious than than the than therapist they yeah. they work with. Yeah. So uh, would you would you say that you're comfortable with the label Christian psychology, a Christian version of psychology? Is that what you're trying to work on? I think so. Uh, I lead with my Christian identity, and so mm -hmm. I don't think I can check it at the door or somehow take off that hat. That's how I see the world. That's how I see reality. My personal view is that the Christian faith tradition offers uh, the most the best, the most accurate understanding of reality. And so I operate out of my Christian worldview. Mm -hmm. I think there are some general psychological principles that might be applicable kind of across yeah. cultures and religious mm -hmm. traditions. And yet I think there are so many unique things about Christianity. And so one of the challenges I think for us as 21st century Christians is that we need to be aware that not all of what's considered quote unquote science in psychology is science. and so some of it is basically based on the assumptions of the people doing the research. And mm -hmm. so I think there's understandably in many churches these days, a cautiousness of interacting with psychology. And I think that's warranted because n no one can really separate out how they do research from their worldview. It's mm -hmm. part of who they are and it's part of the assumptions that they make when they do research and the, the way that they interpret their research findings and the theories they develop. And so I think as Christians, we do need to be cautious about uh, you know, the secular world's version of psychology. And I think there are what I might call psychologies, not just one psychology. Mm -hmm. And that's something that maybe since the formal founding of psychology, we haven't acknowledged as much as we should. I think there was this ambitious, confident idea that we're going to have this grand psychology that everybody's going to agree on. And now we've really splintered and there are lots of different theories and lots of different ways of making sense of personality and clinical work. 
and, and change processes. And so I think we need to recognize that psychologies come from the cultures in which they, mm. they developed and that mm. Christians, we can too say, you know what, there are other psychologies. There's a Buddhist psychology, there's maybe a Jewish psychology, there's a Muslim psychology, and there can be a Christian mm. psychology. So mm -hmm. we do have some universals, I think, a few, but some mm -hmm. that are maybe ways to make sense of all of humankind, mm -hmm. but because psychology is so dependent on our view of the world, mm. I think that there are some differences and it's okay to acknowledge in some ways there is a Christian psychology. Yeah. So, I mean, God made human beings all in his image. We have these commonalities that modern psychology has discovered many of them and, and, and you're able to see that. So I, I, I hear you're not anti-psychology and in fact, you know, I, I think it would be helpful for, for our, our listeners to uh, know that you've deeply uh, engaged with a, a secular model of therapy mm -hmm. and, and, and sought to try and transform it into a distinctly Christian model, right? That's so, right, that's right. Yeah, it's not about, I, I mean, I think sometimes when we talk about a Christian psychology, some might label that as that's maybe fundamentalism or retreating from staying engaged in the world. And that's been the challenge for Christians as we sort of retreated and, and not stayed engaged with the sciences. And, but I would say, I would describe myself as deeply engaged. I, I recognize there are many insights gained from secular psychology. They just are often wrapped up in a worldview that we need to be aware of and, and find ways to disentangle mm. uh, the, the data, if you will, the research findings from the then larger conclusions that are drawn about what that means about mm. the good life, what mm. it means to be human, what it means to understand reality and knowledge and all those things. And mm. so I think as Christians, we need to be discerning but engaged and that we shouldn't just dismiss in a black and white manner all of secular psychology because there are some insights there. We just need to be very much aware of our own tradition and to recognize what we bring to the table. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like uh, if I use a Thanksgiving metaphor, I think earlier Christian psychologists were just trying to get at the table, right? Sit at the table with the adults, not be, you know, confined to the kids table on Thanksgiving. And so earlier attempts were, hey, let's fit in with secular psychology. Uh, I think, though, over time, what I've noticed is we need to start bringing our own dishes to Thanksgiving dinner. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to start to say, as Christians, here are some psychological insights we have that are anchored to our own tradition. And, and the, the world can, can get to see what Christians are all about and some of the things that, that we can bring to the table when it comes to psychological and spiritual health. And so, I think that's kind of what I'm doing is trying, trying to stay at the adult table on Thanksgiving to, to interact with all the other psychologists at the table and to say, here are some dishes that as Christians we bring to the table mm. uh, so that we can uh, try to understand together this thing called the human mm. condition. Well, I have benefited from eating some of the dishes that you brought <laughs> to the table, Josh. It's, uh, it's been great to see you grow in, in your own journey mm -hmm. since I first discovered you, and I'm so glad well, to, to, uh, to have you here on our campus today. Before we finish up, though, you, you did something quite different than anything else you've ever done, and, and it's led to a new book that you and three colleagues have, have come up with. Would you just share briefly about that book? Because I think it would be so interesting to our very diverse campus. Yes, absolutely. So right around 2020, right after the murder of George Floyd, myself and three colleagues, uh, two African Americans and one biracial colleague, we came together and we said, let's talk about what's happened, the pain that has, has come from some of these, these uh, instances of racial injustice. And so we, ta we started talking openly about racism and racial injustice and what to do about it. And we were very much aware that uh, secular communities were, were, were rightly going out of their way to, to face head on some of the historic injustices and to say, we're not going to stand for this anymore. And as Christians committed to our faith tradition, as Christ followers, 
we started asking the question, what do we have coming out of our own faith tradition while, as I mentioned before, staying deeply engaged with psychology and psychological principles and understanding diversity? And so we started these conversations and over a period of time we developed a book on healing conversations on race. So it'll be coming out uh, early 2023. And the idea would be that we can actually become more like Christ as we really lament together about the historic injustice of racism and find ways to develop deeper cross-racial relationships and to support one another through being vulnerable, through expressing emotional pain, and through being responsive to one another's pain. Mm. So there are great models out there that are more on a macro level, looking at systemic injustices, our real model is four steps and it's really about a micro level. It's one-on-one -on -one conversations. It's engaging with people the way Jesus did. And so we believe that each conversation has the opportunity to bring uh, healing and to promote unity, cross-racial unity within the body of Christ. So we don't have uh, churches that are predominantly one race, but that we would be multi-ethnic and multi-racial mm. and that we would together be able to worship and, mm. and walk with God and commune with God. Mm. Well, I can't think of a better place for practicing that model than the Houston area mm. and Houston Christian University. And I look forward to that book because it would be great if we could maybe bring some of those practices into yes. our into our campus. Well, thanks for joining us today. And thank you. I want to thank those of you that have watched this uh, for, for being with us today. Again, I'm Eric Johnson, a, a, a member of the counseling department at Houston Christian University and also a member of the Gideon Institute of Christian Psychology and Counseling. If you're interested in hearing more from Josh, we're going to be uh, posting his lectures uh, on our website in, in a couple of weeks and you should be able to have access to them then. Um, again, thanks. Have a great day.